Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today we had not one but two big pieces of astronomy news. The first one was the one that made all the big news publications. It was about the observation of water in the atmosphere of the smallest exoplanet yet. I mean, so the exoplanet itself is called K2. 18b. That means it was discovered by the K2, the Kepler satellite, after it had um, you know, most of its gyros fail and it was stuck on two operating reaction wheels, sorry. It was able to maintain three axis control by using radiation pressure. So that was the K2 mission. The quality of the data didn't turn out to be quite as good, but they did find objects and they found this one, which is a planet on a 33 day orbit around a, an M class, you know, very small red star. Uh, it was in a 0.15 AU orbit and the planet itself was about 2.7 Earth radii. And you know, this was you know, one of these close-in objects, but based upon the distance and based upon the luminosity of the star, that meant the amount of light it gets is about 5% more than that of the Earth. So that puts it squarely in what we call the habitable zone, although some people call this the not boiling and not freezing zone, because it doesn't necessarily imply that it's habitable, it's just, you know, it's a... <laughs> It's sort of a prerequisite, but it's no guarantee, and perhaps causing, calling it habitable is getting hopes up a little too much. Now, that was one set of observations. Later, that, that meant that other people started looking at this planet, and a group using something called the High Accuracy Radial Planetary Searcher, or HARPS, they went in and what they did, instead of looking at the planet, they looked at the star and they watch its uh, spectral lines and they were able to see that as the planet moved around, the spectral lines get shifted, Doppler shifted. And that's important because the planet was using, you know, the planet's gravity was affecting the position of the star. And that meant that they could actually measure the mass of the planet. And the mass of the planet is somewhere between 7.5 to nine or sorry 10 earth masses and that puts it in the realm of what people call super earths or other people call mini neptunes and uh you know it depends on what narrative you're trying to sell here the uh, harps people also found evidence for a second planet so that would be k218c it's on a nine day orb and i think it's about five earth masses so I mean, the cool thing about this is we've got to the point now that using the Hubble Space Telescope and using Spitzer, we're actually able to analyze the small amount of light coming through the atmosphere around a planet. Previously, using these, uh, you know, these uh, occultations, right, these transit detections, we were having a hard time just detecting the very tiny fraction of a percentage drop in the luminosity of the main star as a planet passed in front of it. But using the Hubble Space Telescope and going back and getting many, many transits, I think over three years they found eight transits that they were able to observe with Hubble and with Spitzer. And they have been able to get sufficient signal to noise ratio to actually detect the absorption spectra that you would where you would see water. And interestingly enough, because these telescopes are all NASA telescopes and they're all essentially public resources, the data wasn't just made available to the team that started this project, it was made available to everyone. And another team basically took the same data and they did their own analysis and they have come to the same conclusion. So we have two papers coming out that have independently analyzed the same data and they are both in agreement that not only do they see water, they also think that the temperature profile of this atmosphere they modeled probably leads to altitudes where you would get liquid water forming and therefore clouds. That being said, you should not take the idea that this is an habitable zone and that this is a super earth and imagine that this means there are oceans of water at the surface because we don't actually know how deep this uh, atmosphere is. More likely, I would lean towards the mini Neptune side of things and this is a very deep atmosphere and there's a water cloud layer and as you go deeper down, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and you end up with something like Venus where it's just ridiculously hot and inhospitable near the surface. So I wouldn't say that this is any indication that there is life on this particular planet or this particular planet is suitable for life, but it is a very good sign that we are able to see water 
in the atmospheres of planets that are close to M-class dwarf stars. Because M-class dwarf stars, they generate a lot of flares and they, many people think that this will actually blow off the atmosphere of nearby planets. In fact, there was another case of an exoplanet where they tried to look for atmosphere. This was a planet called uh, LHS 3844b and it was much closer in. It was uh, 1.3 Earth radii, so its mass was probably slightly higher. This was discovered by the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, if you remember it launched uh, a while back on a SpaceX rocket. So Spitzer did follow up on this and they were actually able to see light reflected and emitting from the surface of this planet and they found that on the side that was near the star it was very hot and on the side the far away it was very cold like which is kind of what you would expect to be honest but the difference in this temperature was high enough that it implied that there wasn't any thick atmosphere on it because if there was a thick atmosphere that would help to equalize the pressures between one side and the other so having seen this small, dead, rocky world, there were those that began to worry that we might not find uh, viable planets around M-class stars. And you know, M-class stars are basically provide probably the most real estate in the universe for uh, planets to live and have habitable zones. So not finding it there, not having, finding that the atmosphere gets blown off these things all the time would be a really bad sign for the chance of life in the universe in general. But this has now turned it around, said, actually, we've got an observation. We know that it's possible. So we will no doubt find more uh, evidence for water in other atmospheres. And I'm gonna say, this is not the first time we've seen water. I kind of mentioned that. This is just the smallest object that we've seen water in the atmosphere. In fact, we've seen many larger gas giants and we've actually seen water in the, star in the atmospheres of some stars, like cold brown dwarfs, the, te the spectra is there. Anyway, that's all very cool. But elsewhere, what I got really excited about is we have found probably another interstellar object, an object that has come from another solar system, and this time it is a comet. And it's been discovered on the way in, so we are going to have much more time to observe this. So the object is called C2019Q4 Borisov, named after the, its discoverer, Gennady Borisov, who works or is at the Crimean Observatory. And he's actually an amateur. He built his own telescope. It's a 0.65 meter telescope that he's been using for comet and asteroid hunting. He got his first pictures of this on August 30th. And over the last week or 10 days or so, we've got more and more positions. We have seen that there is a coma around it. This is definitely a comet. And we were waiting because we kept seeing that the eccentricity of this thing was hyperbolic, meaning that it was passing through from another solar system. But we've seen hyperbolic objects before and you wanna be sure because quite often a hyperbolic initial orbit turns out to be parabolic when you get enough data that are not even that elliptical. But we've got to a point where we think the astrometry, the positional information is good enough to confirm that this is from another solar system. I think one estimate shows that the velocity at infinity is 30 kilometers per second. So it's moving even faster than Oumuamua. And it's a huge difference, right? So this is a comet. It's likely kilometers across. It's going to have a bright coma that's going to make it much easier to image. We're going to get spectra from this. And this is an object that's been in space for a very, very long time, no doubt. Oumuamua was this fascinating object that came and disappeared almost immediately. It didn't have any observable coma, although it had anomalous acceleration that could have been explained by cometary outgassing. It had a light curve that implied a very extremely shaped object, like a cigar shaped object. And it was very, very tiny, so it was very hard to see. So while Oumuamua was the first that was confirmed, I think we're gonna get way more data out of this new one. I'm mean, sure there's some chance that we're going to find out that actually the astrometry is not quite right because comets, you know, the uh, outgassing does change its orbit a little and we might get some refinement yet. But I think at this point, I'm willing to call it and say this is going to be the second interstellar object that has been confirmed. And I am really excited to see what it tells us about the universe. Um, 
So yeah, that's the two big pieces of news elsewhere. I know everybody's still asking me about Vikram and its fate and everybody's telling me that I'm lying and saying that it crashed when uh, actually... So look, the status is that Eyesroll keeps telling us that, oh yes, we've got pictures of it. They haven't shared any of those pictures. They haven't shared any of the data. Uh, so the only information we have to go on really is the Doppler curve that showed that it was still moving a minimum of 200 kilometers per hour when the signal faded out. The signal just turned off. It didn't fade away. We didn't see reflections from the antenna pointing in the wrong direction. If we assume that the, or the velocity continued, it probably hit the ground at 200 to 400 kilometers per hour at a 45 degree angle. It probably bounced, rolled. It may still be in one piece, but it might have left pieces all on the way there. We will probably get our first real look at it by the 17th or 18th because even if ISRO doesn't publish their picture, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter will get a picture by then and, you know, we'll see what, what we're actually seeing. So, I mean, look, as I said, it's the landing that's a failure. The rest of the mission is still a success unless, of course, the reason they're not giving us the picture is because their camera is broken, but I'm hoping their camera works. Seriously, I would love to know more, but I don't have any more on that subject. So I'll, I'll be keeping you appraised. Until the next time, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.